When I disagree with someone these days, I like to say opinions are like podcasts. Everybody has one. So with that said, welcome back to the show. This is uh, the RLW show, I'm calling it for now. Um, this particular series is Epistemology with Robert. That's the important thing. But uh, thanks for listening again. Um, this is now the eighth episode of Epistemology, so thanks for everyone who's stuck with me this far. A uh, couple quick things up front. I'm going to look into uh, Anchor, which is my host. They allow you to receive messages from listeners, which I think could be really cool. So check that out. I might be putting a link in the show notes or on my blog about that if you want to leave a message, ask a question, something like that. That'd be super fun. Second thing is, this is a pretty esoteric topic. Uh, Dylan, if you're out there listening, I just said esoteric for you. Inside joke. Um, But because of that, I'm going to go ahead and ask and say, if you have another nerd in your life who, who likes to nerd out about philosophy or epistemology or just overthinking things in life that probably don't even need to be overthought, then please spread the word. Let them know because it's always fun to find people who geek out on this stuff as well. Uh, I know they're out there, but they're they're not extremely common. So anyway, with that said, this is going to be about software engineering. Um, this is, uh, I've been a software engineer for the past nine years, eight and a half years now. Um, actually at the same company. Um, it's been uh, a smooth ride for me since I graduated, which has been awesome. And what's been interesting is, obviously, since I'm spending 40 hours a week in this career, you you learn a lot from that and you have plenty of time to think about how you do it. And since I'm philosophically minded anyway, of course, I'm going to analyze that. But what was kind of surprising is I sort of came to the same sort of black swan ideas from software engineering um, as I did through the book Black Swan. And uh, in particular, I want to call out a book called Release It by Michael Nygaard. Or Nygaard. Um, he, it's a book about releasing big software systems and making things robust and resilient. Um, and it really had a, it had an influence on me um, because it was relatively early on that I read it in my career, and it really does have a lot of the same ideas that Black Swan has. In fact, um, I did not get the Black Swan out um, for this podcast, but there's a chapter in Black Swan near the end that I think it says it's called like on um, fragility and robustness or something like that, and it's just. It's funny to see that in a book about economics and epistemology because that sounds right out of a software architecture book talking about fragility and robustness. So there clearly is uh, an overlap here. So I'm going to just take you through kind of a little bit biographically how I learned a lot of the same lessons in software engineering that I learned from a book like The Black Swan. So in school with computer science, you're uh, by necessity working on small projects and working on individual ideas and trying to master them. And you that works well. And I mean, this is really true of any school topic is you tend to, the scope usually is small and you master one thing at a time. And that works well. You learn it. You start to gain some confidence. The problem is once you get on the, the real world, things are not that simple. And I think particularly with software systems, it's like this, just because they're so, it's evolving so quickly. There's so many technologies. Um, people can code something and put it in production very quickly compared to perhaps a lot of fields as far as like building something and putting it out there really quickly. So it becomes very, very hard to have the same approach. And obviously, it's not even uh, another obstacle. And this this is true of a lot of different fields, is that you don't have the same measurement of success that you do in school. You don't get a lit letter grade. But really, the, the main thing I want to focus on is that to try to do, to code your program, your project perfectly, 
starts to become almost an impossible task the bigger it grows. It really does become an impossible task the bigger it grows because it's kind of an exponential function. And I particularly experienced this with a system I developed over many years um, at my job called uh, Environments, is uh, the, the, um, the name of the project. And it was a project I built from the ground up. And it was something that I, I got to this point where I realized it, it had continued to grow in usage and size and everything, but it since it had grown from this small system gradually over the years, it really needed to be rewritten in a lot of ways. And this was like four or five years in to the project in my career at FactSet. And it really, I, I didn't have anyone working for me at this time. I was the only person working on this project. And it seemed like if I were to do this the proper way, it would never get done. And what I mean by that is very carefully code each part as perfectly as I can and slowly release it and and do one piece at a time like that. I just realized there simply is not enough time to do that. So I either had to decide to, to do that and just never make a ton of progress and it just kind of do what I can and see what happens in the future or find another way to do it. And what I ended up finding, and this really, a lot of it came from reading, release it, and thinking through a lot of these, these ideas, is what happened is I experienced really the same thing I experienced with reading The Black Swan, which is all of, all of a sudden you experience this flipping in your thinking, this inversion of instead of focusing on the positive thing you can complete, you instead focus on the the limits. You kind of zoom out, look at the map. So with Black Swan thinking, you're looking at the map of knowledge and you're protecting yourself. Um, you're protecting yourself from the unknown, from those black swans. And software engineering, you can do the exact same thing. So to, to kind of compress this a little bit, this explanation, I came up with a way of programming that I call safety net programming. This isn't something super novel or anything. It was just my own formulation of some of the ideas from release it and otherwise. And basically the idea, I think uh, the analogy is, picture trying to learn to be a trapeze artist. And you can, you can try to master all the moves and trust that you will not fall to your death because you've mastered all the moves or you can put up a safety net and then relax and have plenty of time to learn everything. And it's just a completely different approach. The first is to, to focus on making this perfect system of learning all the moves and nailing it, um, but there's this huge amount of risk. The other is you're kind of not worrying about doing all the, the technique and the moves correctly. And first you're just making the worst case scenario way less worse. Now the worst case scenario is you get mildly injured in the safety net and then you you go back from there and, and then it buys you plenty of time to actually learn the moves correctly. So in the context of my project, and this is when the rubber um, met the road for me, is that I, instead of trying to code up a perfect replacement for my project, instead I thought, what is the worst case scenario and how can I make that better? So um, I picture the worst case scenario happening, which is my system failing in a very major way. And I realized, well, what do I, what's the first thing I can do to make that better? And I decided, well, alerting. I want to be alerted that that happens. I want to get emails, texts, whatever. So I did that. I added uh, an alerting system. So now even when there's tons of bugs, I'll at least know that everything's hitting the fan and I can work to fix that. And then I can fix whatever bug caused it after that. And the next thing was, okay, if learning is working, what's the next thing I can do? Well, I can log. I can put tons of logging messages so that when I get alerted and I get the system working again, I can th look through the logs and make it better the next time, uh, at least much more quickly because Hopefully the logs will just show me what's wrong. 
So I got that working. Now alerting and logging is working. What's the next thing I can do? Well, the next thing I can do is I can make it recover quickly. So I did that. And so if you notice, all three of those things have nothing to do with writing correct code. Like all these assume I've already screwed up, but it, it's a safety net. I'm building these safety nets. And I, once I had enough safety nets in place, I was able to release massive changes to core parts of my code with very little fear because I knew if there's anything wrong with it, that I would get an immediate alert, it would um, fail gracefully and quickly, and it would be minimal user impact. And because of that, I was able to rewrite my project uh, in about a year, basically, um, or at least rewrite a large portion of it. And that would have just been completely, utterly impossible if I hadn't taken that approach. And it was just this kind of mind-expanding eye-opening experience, um, just like the Black Swan thing. And it was, and it really is, I really think it's a practical um, expression of the exact same Black Swan ideas. It's, it's zooming out and looking at the map of possibilities rather than just gaining, with uh, epistemology, just gaining knowledge with software en engineering, just writing good code. That's the, the equivalent. And so it's zooming out, not worrying about that as primary, and instead looking at the map of the situation, looking at the worst case scenarios, and drawing boundaries around things to say, okay, this is where the really bad stuff is. This is the bare minimum I, I could do to protect myself against that. And so you kind of build out this map, and then once you have the map, you can focus on the details. So it ended up just being a very similar idea, very similar feeling, and it um, it just it really reinforced this epistemology. And I think we can probably all relate to the feeling that when we see an idea confirmed from multiple different disparate places, it really adds strength to it. And uh, just just to make the the application of this um, software engineering um, these ideas to some of the examples I've given before, the the talking about inerrancy in the Bible and uh, uh, Jesus's resurrection as an alternative way to uh, found your faith to to but as a foundation, it's a very similar idea. You could see the inerrancy and all the problems, potential problems in the Bible as potential bugs. So you could either try to have zero bugs in your program, and in fact, it's funny I'm, that I'm using this term because. One of my friends who started as a Christian and became a skeptic, he actually referred to a lot of, uh, referred to some of the problems in the Old Testament for him as bugs in a program, that it was like bugs that he couldn't solve. So it's uh, not a coincidence that I'm using that terminology. So you could either try to have zero bugs in your program, which might be the case. I mean, I'm not saying for sure there are bugs, but I'm not sure, I, I don't want to put that weight on me to ensure there are no bugs when I don't even have to go that approach. And instead, I can work on the safety net. And the analogy of the safety net programming to apologetics would be focusing on uh, not, not caring if the Bible is inspired and instead focusing on the specific historical evidence that is, uh, is secure regardless of biblical inspiration. So that's kind of the safety net. And then you can play around safely figuring out if how the Bible works, if it's inspired, if there's errors or whatever. So I know that was a bit rambly. Um, I wanted to just try to get that out there about, um, yeah, how, how software engineering influenced me in this way. Um, so I hope some of that partly made sense, at least. And um, please leave me questions, voicemails, whatever. I'm going to try to get that set up. And um, next time, what are we talking about next time? Wow. So the, this is, we've covered some of the most core concepts for me with my epistemology. First being the engineer to intuitionist and then the black swan concepts. And I think I'm going to touch on smaller topics going forward. They're still important, but these are probably the most foundational. So thanks for listening with me so far.